Are we ready yet? Yeah, we're all good to go. Thanks, Chair. Great, okay. It is now 5.30 to order everyone for this meeting of the Council of the 25th of February 2021. Good evening, members and officers of the Council and members of the press and public. I welcome you to this meeting of the Council. Prior to this meeting, all participants have previously checked that they can be heard and seen and can see and hear other members. It is vital that you can be heard and it is preferred that cameras are kept on throughout the meeting. To double check this and to introduce everyone who is present at this remote meeting, I would kindly ask that I confirm your attendance and your role or job title when I say your name. I shall now go through a list for this evening. Councillor Albon. Uh, here, Chair, a uh, Cabinet Member for Operations Services and Ward Councillor for Eastcliff, Ramsgate. Excellent. Councillor Ara. Good evening, Chair. Uh, Ward Councillor for Central Harbour Ward in Ramsgate. Councillor Ashby. Shadow Leader and Ward Councillor for Westbrook. Thank you. Councillor Bailey. Good evening. Councillor for Ward Councillor for Viking Ward. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Bambridge. I'm Councillor for Westgate on Sea. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Jill Bayford. Here, Chair. Um, Councillor for Bradstow Ward and uh, Shadow Portfolio holder, holder for Housing. <laughs> Thank you. Councillor Robert Bayford. Evening, Chair. I'm Chair of Overview and Scrutiny and Ward Councillor for Kingsgate. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Boyd. Good evening, Chair, and to everyone, I'm the Councillor for Garlings Ward. Thank you. Councillor Braidwood. Councillor Braidwood. I shall come back later. Councillor Coleman Cook. Here, Chair. Um, Vice Chair of Planning and Ward Councillor for Birchington North. Thank you very much. Councillor Crittenden. Present Chair, Eastcliff Ward, Ramsgate. Councillor Curry. Good evening, Chair. Um, Vice Chair of Overview and Scrutiny and Ward Councillor for Cliftonville West. Thank you. Councillor Day. Councillor Day. I shall come back. Councillor Dennis. Evening, Chair. Councillor for Garlings Ward. Thank you. Councillor Dexter. Evening, Chairman. Councillor for St Peter's Ward. Councillor Duckworth. Good evening, Chair. Cabinet Member for Estates and Economic Development, Dane Valley Ward. Councillor Everett. Uh, good evening, Chair. Uh, Ward Councillor for Newington and Leader of the Council. Thank you. Councillor Farrance. Uh, good evening. I'm Farmston Ward Councillor. Thank you. Councillor Fellows. Yeah, evening, Chair. I'm the Councillor for Birchinson South. Thank you. Councillor Gain. Um, evening, Councillor for Cliftonville East. Thank you. Councillor Garner. Good evening. I'm Councillor for St Peter's. I'm leader of the Green Group and I'm also now Chair of Governance and Audit Committee. Thank you. Councillor Green. Um, Councillor Green, Ward Councillor for Nethercourt and Southwood. Thank you. Councillor Gregory. Evening, Councillor for Salmston Ward. Thank you. Councillor Hart. Evening, Chair. Uh, Councillor for Thanet Villages. Thank you. Councillor Hopkinson. Uh, yes. Councillor for Sir Moses Montefiore Ward. Thank you. Councillor Huxley. Hello, Chair. I'm a Councillor for Eastcliff Ward in Ramsgate. Thank you. Councillor Keane. Good evening, Chair. Councillor for Cliftonville West. Thank you. Councillor Cop. Good evening, Chair. Shadow Cabinet Member for Operational Services and Councillor for Birchland South. Thank you. Councillor Pat Moore. Evening, Chair. Councillor for Sir Moses Montefiore Ward. Thank you. Councillor Paul Moore. Good evening, Chair. Uh, Ward Councillor for Beacon Ward. Thank you. Councillor Ovenden. Uh, here, Chair, yeah, Member for Nevercourt. Councillor Parsons. Evening, Chair. Uh, Councillor for Bradstow. 
Thank you. Councillor Linda Piper. Apologies, Chair. Apologies received and accepted. Thank you. And I take it you're with us, Councillor Piper. Councillor Stewart Piper. Uh, yes. Good evening, Mr Chairman. Yes, I'm here, uh, leader of the Thanet Independence Group and general all-round nuisance. Uh, I'm not going to say anything right now. Councillor Potts. Councillor Potts. Apologies, Chair. She will be arriving late. Right. OK. Apologies accepted in lieu. Councillor Pugh. Evening, Chair. Councillor Pugh, uh, Ward Member for Thanet Villages and Shadow Deputy Leader. Thank you. Councillor Rattigan. Dear Chair, good evening. Councillor for Cliffs End and Pegwell. Thank you. Councillor Rolfe. Good evening, uh, Beacon Ward Councillor. Thank you. Councillor Rogers. Good evening, Chair. Um, Ward Councillor for Cliffs End and Pegwell. Thank you. Councillor Roper. Evening, Chair. Councillor for Thanet Villages. Thank you, Councillor Rizeki. Evening Chair, Councillor for Northwood and Deputy Leader of the Thanet Independents. Thank you, Councillor David Saunders. Good evening Chair, Viking Ward Councillor, Shadow Cabinet Member for Finance, Administration and Community Wealth Building. Thank you very much, Councillor Maeve Saunders. Present Chairman, Councillor for Viking Ward and Chairman of Joint Transportation. Thank you, Councillor Saunders. You might find you've got a little bit of trouble with feedback. You might want to look at it. Councillor Scobie. Uh, evening, Chair, President. Uh, Councillor for Cliftonville West. Thank you. Councillor Scott. Good evening, Chair, Ward Councillor for Westgate on Sea. Thank you. Councillor Shrub. Here, Chair, Councillor for Cliftonville East. Thank you. Councillor Tomlinson. Uh, good evening, Chair, Councillor for Westbrook and Chairman of the Planning Committee. Thank you. Councillor Towning. Evening, Councillor for Clifton Real East. Thank you. Councillor Whitehead. Present Chair, uh, Councillor for Margate Central, Deputy Leader and Cabinet Member for Housing and Safer Communities. Quite so. Councillor Wing. Evening, Chair, Councillor for Central Harbour in Ramsgate. Thank you. Councillor Wright. Good evening, Chair, Vice Chairman and Ward Councillor for Birchington South. And finally, Councillor Yates. Good evening, Chair, uh, Margaret Central Ward and Cabinet Member for Finance, Administration and Community Wealth Building. Thank you. I'll just return to see if Councillor Braidwood is with us. Councillor Braidwood. Apologies, Mr Chairman. He's offered apologies. He's not just absent, he has apologised. Councillor Day. Do I have Councillor Day? I don't have any apologies, therefore I shall mark him as absent. Moving on to uh, officers in attendance, we have the Chief Executive, Ms Homer, the Deputy Chief Executive, Mr Willis, the Director of Operational Services, Mr Waite, the Director of Law and Democracy, Ms Culligan, and the Committee Services Manager, Mr Hughes. Now then, as we go through the meeting, if you have any technical difficulties during the meeting, then please contact one of the Democratic Services officers on the call who will attempt to assist you. I would ask participants, when you're not speaking, please mute your microphone. This minimises background noise and will help everyone listening to the proceedings. Microphones must be only be on if participant has been granted permission to speak. To gain my permission to speak, please very briefly indicate on the chat to the right side of the screen and I will then make a note and come back to you once the person speaking has finished. With respect to webcasting of proceedings, please note this meeting is being live streamed for members of the public, except for any item of business where exempt or confidential information is considered following the exclusion of the press and public from the meeting. This meeting is also being recorded and will be subsequently broadcast on the internet. With respect to restriction of use of mobile phones, would everyone present please ensure their mobile phones are turned to silent and they are not used to make or receive phone calls whilst the meeting is in progress. Do not turn your phone off as it will make it harder for democratic services to contact you should they need to.
Please also refrain from checking emails or conducting other business and ensure that you're in a quiet room, free from distractions for the duration of the meeting. Now then, agenda item one, therefore, apologies for absence. Uh, apart from Councillor Day, I've not received any apologies for this evening. Group leaders, do you have any apologies you wish to reassert? I don't think so, I've gone through a thorough list. Moving therefore on to agenda item two, minutes of the meeting held on the 9th of July, 2020. I move that the minutes of the meeting of the Council held on 11th of February 2021 be approved and signed as a correct record. Would the Vice Chairman please second? Second that, Mr Chairman. Unless anyone objects the minutes, I will take them as agreed. Thank you. Therefore, moving on to agenda item three, announcements. I am very sorry to announce, and I know a good few of us are already aware of this, but sorry to announce the recent passing of Councillor Peter Campbell. Councillor Campbell first became a Thanet District Councillor in 2007 and served the Central Harbour Ward in Ramsgate for 14 years. I'd ask members to pause for a minute's silence in respect of Councillor Campbell. Thank you, everyone. Now, I do have a list of members who would like to say a few words about Councillor Campbell. For my part, I shall very much miss Councillor Campbell. In my time here at Thanet Council, I have been chairman of the Governance and Audit Committee, which, as some of you know, is quite a demanding committee, but I could always rely on Peter. To have not only thoroughly read his paperwork, but to be ready with questions and observations important to the business. He could unravel issues which could only come from a full understanding of what was going on. A truly great and committed councillor. I call on Councillor Everett, the leader of the council. Yes, thank you, Chair. And uh, I have to say this is probably the saddest task that I've had as a councillor. Um, and I know that I speak for many of us when I say that I've personally lost a good friend as well as an outstanding colleague. The fact that we knew this day was coming doesn't make it any easier but at least it allowed us to let Peter know the respect and affection with which he was regarded across the council. And I know that he did appreciate that. The other consolation that we should take tonight is that Peter loved being a councillor and he got to do it for 14 years. He took enormous pride and satisfaction in representing Ramsgate and Central Harbour in particular. In fact, he was still working away on residence behalf from the hospice he was in on the day before he died. His commitment to this council since 2007 and to Ramsgate Town Council was extraordinary. Um, if you look on the council website, it's a statistical fact that he attended far more meetings than anyone else. But more importantly, as you've alluded to, he'd always done his homework and he always had something to contribute. And quite often that would be a joke to lighten the mood because he was quite a funny man. And I still remember the leaflet that he produced in Central Harbour Ward in 2011 before the election, in which he introduced the Labour candidates, Corinna Huxley and Mary Dwyer, as she then was, as his new assistants, which perhaps wasn't very appropriate, but being Peter, he got away with it. Away from Central Harbour, he didn't want to be a leader, but he had authority because he usually knew what he was talking about. And he was always willing to share his knowledge and experience, including with me. So I have had two bites at this because I've obviously referred to it in my leader's speech and I know lots of other people wish to speak. 
to, but just to conclude, our thoughts must be with Mitzi, his partner, and his wider family, but this council will miss him deeply, and me more than most. And I know that he won't be forgotten by any of us who had the good fortune to work with him. Thank you very much indeed, Councillor Everett. Can I turn to Councillor Pugh next uh, to say a few words? Councillor Pugh. Thank you, Chair. Um, I mean, as, as I think everyone was, I was incredibly saddened to hear of, um, of the passing of Councillor Campbell. I have uh, very fond memories as a newly elected uh, member in 2018, um, in a bit of a baptism of fire as we first week we voted down the local plan. But I remember um, being put on the Governance and Audit Committee and sitting next to Peter on, on many an occasion and the, the wisdom and, and just the energy that he had. And, and as um, the leader has said, he was a councillor for, for such a long time, but that experience really shined through. And, and I consider myself very lucky that although I was only on the Governance and Audit Committee with him for a, a short period up until the 2019 elections, you know, everything that I learned from him, I'll always remember because, you know, the way in which he conducted himself and the way in which he scrutinised his council and the questions that he raised. And, you know, very often, and I was particularly in a way, and I'm glad to admit it, intimidated by Councillor Campbell and the knowledge that he had. But one thing that I'll always remember is that, you know, he was always, always willing to kind of have a bit of a chuckle and no. you know and we were able to kind of laugh sometimes um and particularly as a new councillor you know very intimidated by the council and, and and members and not really knowing you know when i should speak and my voice and stuff like that he was always very encouraging um and you know and i think him and councillor uh, who was councillor messenger carol partington at the time were a real force to be reckoned with um, particularly in holding to account uh, the ukip chair of that of that committee um so i will i will remember him fondly and, and I think he's the real loss uh, to all residents of Thanet because I think he did such a, a stellar job and, and if I can one day be as good a councillor as him then I think I would have done all right. Thank you very much indeed for that Councillor Pugh. Councillor Ara. Councillor Ara. Thank you Chair, yes. <clears throat> I was extremely honored to be elected as the ward councillor for Central Harbour in Ramsgate alongside my fellow councillor Peter Campbell and Becky Wing in 2019. Peter was a very state talking councillor. He was extremely popular among the people of Ramsgate. And I have enjoyed every single minute that I spent with him, either campaigning or uh, going through caseworks. And I will always remember him for this. I have learned so much from him. There is an English expression that says, I stand upon the shoulders of giants. Peter was one of my giants. My deepest condolences go out to his wife, Mitzi, and to his family. May he rest in peace. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ara. Councillor Tomlinson. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you for allowing me just to say a few words. Um, a lot has already been stated by other members and I'm sure there is more to come. I met Peter at a social function. Um, I can't really recall how many years ago, but it's got to be about 20 years ago in Ramsgate before he became a councillor. Uh, many people were aware that I was involved in organising carnival events over here in Margate. And we were at a carnival event. Peter um, wanted to get involved in Ramsgate. Uh, committees and so on. Um, straight away I, I started to uh, like Peter, his comments, he said who he was, what he wanted to do and a friendship built up over many years and as I said, it's already been said, um, he, he was straight talking, uh, he knew what he wanted to talk about, there wasn't a committee meeting that went by where he wasn't or didn't say something and this is a, a great loss when I heard, and I, I think we've all seen over a number of years how he has deteriorated, um, which is very, very sad and he's in peace now. Um, a great friend, myself and my other half, um, and um, one of the biggest things I think with Peter, uh, we all do things in life. What Peter did was wonderful for Ramsgate, but he didn't shout about it. And I think that is quite something. And uh, again, I wish his family our thoughts. Thank you, Chairman. 
Thank you very much, Councillor Tomlinson. Councillor Whitehead. Thank you, Chair. Um, I've been lucky enough to have some exceptional teachers. One, my history teacher, prepared me very well for life and for this role. In everything, he talked about the importance of facts and opinions, of primary and secondary and tertiary sources, and how to know if the information you have is accurate, how to know if you can trust in it, how to cross-reference, and challenge yourself and others in terms of your understanding and knowledge. I've long used those skills in theory. Councillor Campbell taught me how to use them in practice. All of us in the chamber know how good he was, know how well and how thoroughly he did his research. That he knew how and when to challenge and that he challenged anyone, regardless of party, if he thought it was the right thing to do. I only knew Peter for a few years but he knew me as a new and scared councillor, as a new and scared shadow cabinet member, and eventually as a new equally scared and determined deputy leader within that time. And his advice was always the same. Do your research, find the facts, challenge who you need to, when you need to, and don't be afraid when you're doing it. Or if you can't manage that, don't look afraid. I'm not good with public grief, but we have all lost a strong, formidable and committed councillor. And I'm still trying to imagine the chamber without his voice interjecting to deliberately ask me an entertainingly difficult question about paragraph 76, subsection 2 in the third appendix. And I can't imagine it. And I don't want to. because the chamber will be so much sadder without him and without his deliberate, conscientious and above all entertaining scrutiny. Councillor Campbell was, to the very core of him, the essence of good scrutiny. He challenged clearly, he challenged well and he challenged anyone he needed to. He challenged me and he taught me how to be a better councillor. I don't think he'd want me to end on a sad note and I'm trying not to. So I'm going to talk about the legacy he left. So here's to those who know how to challenge effectively. May we know them. May we be thankful to have known them. And in memory of Councillor Campbell, may we be them. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Councillor um, Whitehead. I, I think all of us are very moved by the emotions that you feel this evening. Thank you very much indeed for that. Councillor Wing. Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, such a sad time. In Ramsgate, we seem to have lost too many of our community champions this year, and Peter was amongst the very best of them. Uh, a committed family man, dog lover, obviously, with three, 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 three dogs that he loved so much, and one who loved his role as a counsellor. He performed his role with determination, commitment, and most importantly, concern for residents. And he did all this with a sense of humor. He will be missed by so many, and I send much love to Mitzi and his family and close friends. Councillor Ara and myself are determined to try and do our best for the people of Central Harbour without uh, Peter. Uh, a sign of the man and his commitment to it was he was still sharing emails, not only with, I, I believe, other councillors, but also with myself, and one that left me close to tears. And that was just a matter of eight or nine hours before 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 the, the colossus of a man died. Uh, I he's going to be a hard uh, set of boots to fill, I think, in Central Harbour. Uh, uh, but we'll keep trying to do what we can in Central Harbour in, in, in Peter's memory, and we'll put party differences aside to make sure we try and do that. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Councillor Wing. Councillor Pat Moore.
Councillor Patmore. I'm trying to. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'd just like to say that I've known Peter for a long time. Not very well to start with, but I've known him, like me, about 20 years and meet say because they frequented the same pub. And then he had long blonde hair brushed back. Do you remember that, Mick? And he, he was a very social socialist in that pub. It talked to anybody about Labour. My son used to have frequent chats with him about Labour and all it stands for. And uh, I remember him and I became to admire him for his wit and wisdom. We shared cars uh, when we were going to uh, meetings at TDC and RTC and uh, we've chatted quite a bit and I found he was a very brave man facing whatever he had to with courage and he also liked a joke. I can he told me once when we were coming back from TDC about when he was a young man and he lived in London and he was all booted and suited, dressed up, smartly dressed, shoes polished and he was walking over, I think it was a canal bridge and there were some boys at the top, youths, shouting at men on boats underneath and throwing stones I presume and he said they ran off the guys from the boats came up behind him, grabbed him and threw him in the river. You know, that was, and he still thought it was very funny. So did I. And another story about Peter, how we like to joke. Uh, we were in the council chamber and uh, a councillor from across the chamber was asking about something and he's had to have a number. They said, you've got to give us a number for this. And he said, oh, I don't know. So Peter said, this isn't the number, but it's, I know he did it. And he said, oh, uh, that's AB234. So he said, oh, thank you very much, AB234. Yeah. When we finished the meeting and we were driving home, Mary King was in the car as well. And she said, oh, you are clever, Peter, remembering that number. He said, no, I made it up. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that just typifies what is like and you know I became to be very fond of him and uh, I once said to him a politician is not that far apart from a stand-up comedian and he was both thank you Thank you very much indeed, uh, Councillor Moore. And that's marvellous to have, hear a couple of jokes on behalf of Peter. Uh, Councillor Rolfe. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, Councillor Campbell, he was a truly a unique councillor. And I think uh, many people know him, agree with that. Um, I first met him in 2007 uh, when he helped to bring love music, head racism to Ramsgate. And also, he helped to bring all the uh, event organizer together in Ramsgate where we set up a uh, Ramsgate event organizer group to make sure all the uh, event in Ramsgate not clash on each other's and they all help each other to set up uh, or, uh, all the events. Um, and often we meet up accidentally on my walk and we end up having a coffee. As I elected as a councillor, he gave me two advice. And that your advice will benefit anybody who would like to become a councillor one day. The first one was, he said, you go out and do what you do. People agree with your politic. They already agree with what you are doing. Try to get the people don't agree with your politic, agree with what you are doing. And that is hard for anybody to try to do that. And Peter managed to do that. People wasn't agree with his politic. They were agree with what he was doing in a community. And as second one uh, was, he said, make sure when you are out there, uh, try to um, uh, first do all the training if you can attend 
if you cannot attend to the training, get the slide from the officer and go introduce yourself face to face to them as a new league counselor. Then tomorrow when you email them, they know who you are and who they speak to. That two advice is state as a legacy in my mind, and I will pass it to anybody who wish one day to become a counselor. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Councillor Wolf. And of course, I think all of us can see the wisdom in that. Councillor Scobie. Thank you, Chair. Um, I first bumped into Peter in about 2006 when we were having a, um, a training course for uh, potential new councillors. Um, Peter reminded me very much of the Harry Enfield character. That's not how you do it, um, because he seemed to have an answer for everything. Mm -hmm. However, my first impressions were very, very wrong because um, his mastery of uh, a brief and um, how he always managed to do the job with diligence, but tremendous humor. Uh, when I became chair of the Labour group, um, I used to meet with uh, Peter and Rick and various other people outside various cafes in Ramsgate so they could put me right because, of course, being a Margate person, I didn't know anything about Ramsgate. Um, so it's with great sadness that I'm going to miss those coffee with Peter and Mitzi and his three lovely dogs and I... Uh, I, I hope the, the, the family will enjoy uh, a celebration of his life uh, when this COVID nuisance lets us do so. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Scobie. And last on my list, I have Councillor Alban. Councillor Alban. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, I haven't got anything written, written down and uh, I'm not as eloquent as some of our previous speakers about P Peter. Um, I know Peter as an officer of the council uh, when he was first a councillor and um, because he used to come into the planning office on a regular basis and um, and being a couple of old bald London boys as we were, but are still, um, we got on pretty, pretty, pretty well and we had a similar sen sense of humour and um, it was always a pleasure. And since being elected as a councillor, and I used to give Peter lifts home from meetings, and uh, and we'd have a laugh about whatever it was about what somebody said or they got wrong at the meeting and stuff like that. But um, everybody said everything about Peter. But I just want to say, um, from one old London geezer to Peter, I'm going to miss you, mate. Thank you very much indeed, Councillor Alban. Is there anybody I've missed, anybody remaining who'd like to speak? Well, councillors, I think really it says it all. Um, we've lost a got an excellent colleague and an excellent friend. We'll miss him from the chamber. Um, and I think the sheer sentiment expressed tonight says all. So thank you very much. Moving on to agenda item four, declarations of interest. Are there any declarations of interest this evening? I haven't had any indications and I can see from anybody, so no. Moving on to agenda item five there for petitions. Uh, agenda item five, a Park Avenue broad says petition, the report back to council. Now this is for information only. Would members please note the cabinet response to the petition as detailed in the report. I call upon the leader, Councillor Everett, for an update here, which I believe he has for us. Councillor Everett. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, I just wanted to put into the record um, a note that an appeal has been lodged against the enforcement action, which is referenced in the report, um, which is in accordance with proper process. Um, and just to reassure residents that um, the Council remains well aware of the level of public interest in this matter and that our actions will continue to reflect that. Just a bit of an update. Yes, thank you very much indeed. Thank you for that. Uh, therefore, moving on to agenda item six, questions from the press and public, I would say first of all, just to make members of the public aware, democratic services can assist you in crafting your question if you are unsure of the appropriate wording. <laughs> Uh, this is for future use, of course. If you would like any assistance, please look at the Council's speaking at 
council meetings webpage or contact democratic services team who will be happy to help. Now, one question has been received from a member of the public for us uh, this evening uh, in accordance with council procedure rule number 13. Uh, please note that only the questioner and respondent are permitted to speak on the question and that if the questioner is not present at this meeting, their question cannot be put but be replied to in writing. Therefore, agenda item 6A, question number one from a member of the public regarding grants and developer contribution. I will, I'm pleased to welcome Miss Austin to the meeting. Could the questioner please turn on their microphone, state the name of the cabinet member to whom their question is to be put and read out the exact wording of the question that they submitted to the council. Miss Austin, are you there? I'm here, thank you, Chair. Um, I believe my question is directed at the leader and it's as follows. As council budgets tighten, external funding and investment become increasingly important. What strategies is TDC adopting to maximise environmental and social investment from developers, monitor and access grant funding opportunities, and nurture mutually supportive partnerships with community groups who can often access specific funding streams that will benefit our communities? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Austin. I call upon the leader to respond. Yeah, good evening, Miss Austin. Thank you. Thank you for your question and congratulations on your ingenuity in fitting in um, so much into the 50 words allowed at the moment. <laughs> I'm going to give you a very long answer. Um, so I warn members about that. Um, first of all, I welcome your recognition that the council budget continues to be a challenging exercise, drawing on all our skills of both members and officers to continue to provide services and retain aspiration to pursue other positive opportunities for our residents. I also want to recognise the contribution that residents make to our annual survey because those views are important in helping the council understand their priorities. I'm going to approach your question in three sections, developer contributions, grant funding and community groups. Developer contributions. Um, the local plan sets out a strategic approach to contributions from developers and house builders and sets out requirements for the provision of social and environmental measures in new development. For example, education, health, open space, landscaping and tree planting, water and energy efficiency and biodiversity net gain. We monitor the collection and use of all financial and other contributions and we publish agreements known as Section 106 agreements. In, particular, in addition, we've succeeded in achieving the following. Um, £49,000 for affordable housing. Uh, contributions utilised on bringing forward homes for affordable housing. Retort House and Piermont Hall, 600,000 grant awarded to Broadstairs and St Peter's Council to bring forward uh, those properties for refurbishment. 136,000 for Broadstairs Playground refurbishment. There's a £49 million bid in for the uh, to the major road network for a major road network improvement. Um, and ho Homes England grant funding for new build phases um, of 860,000. Um, there's 666,000 from CELEP, monies utilised on the renovation of two properties in the intervention area. Um, and there are grant funded programmes for tackling rogue landlords and cold homes and to employ a home energy officer to advise residents about available grant funding. We have the largest disability uh, facilities grant programme in Kent at 3 million annually and a total of 1.35 million uh, has been received for RISE funding across a range of initiatives for homeless people. Um, that's a co-design process involving the District Council, MHCLG and local voluntary sector and community groups. So just some of the grant funded projects for uh, recent years. Um, Ramsgate Flood and Coast Protection Scheme, 900,000. Um, the uh, Dolby Square Scheme, 1.9 million from the Heritage Lottery Fund, 1.378 million from Homes England for the Affordable Homes Programme, 527,000 from the Forestry Commission for the Thanet Community Forest, 324,000 from the Environment Agency for the Eccle Bay Seawall, and 162,000 uh, initially for the Margate Town Fund. Uh, and obviously there's a bid into the Margate Town deal for 29 million. Um, there's another 750,000 from MHCLG uh, further funding in relation to the town's fund to renovate a key building, which you probably know has already been brought forward. There's 2.7 million for the Future High Street Fund, 
Um, there's Heritage Action Zone, five year joint program working with historic England and key community groups uh, in Ramsgate. There's a High Street Heritage Action Zone uh, scheme uh, currently in discussion with historic England. Uh, there's 18 million pounds worth of public investment, including a five million Heritage, Heritage Lotteries Fund grant for Dreamland. And of course, a substantial amount of money for Thanet Parkway Station. Um, and in terms of uh, community groups, obviously Ellington Park is a good example. Uh, 1.643 from the million from the Heritage Lottery Fund. Um, in terms of other projects, we've recently worked with Rise Up Clean Up on a project to tackle the complicated issues we face with litter on our beaches, exploring a variety of initiatives. One of these is the introduction of some new litter bag dispensers around the coast in Margate. These are similar to the Tixback dog waste dispensers we have in place already, part funded by TDC, but mainly crowdfunded by the community group. We help with the agreements and the installation and they, we will keep them stocked with bags. This is the model for the type of project we'll be looking to expand in other areas of the district with local groups. We're exploring ways to work more closely with our coastal businesses this summer to support them, uh, also to have their assistance in spreading messages to our visitors. Our climate change officer is looking to external grant funding to help us achieve our targets and deliver on our climate action plan. A number of funding bids have already been submitted. The open spaces team and climate change officer are working with local communities and groups on projects that will improve our tree canopy cover and biodiversity across the district. Over the years, we've worked with a number of community groups to try and find solutions to ongoing problems related to waste, recycling and other public realm issues. The team work with developers to try and ensure that these common problems are designed out in the future. Historically, we've worked with a variety of community groups across the district to support beach clean litter picking activities through the giving out of equipment and health and safety advice. And this was externally funded. Through our work as part of the Kent Resource Partnership, we've benefited from funding which has enabled waste related communications and behaviour change projects. An example is the food waste campaign, giving out free caddies and bin liners which we ran, which was funded by RAP and saw an 11% increase in food recycling. Our education enforcement officer is and will continue working to support a number of community groups and local schools. And we're exploring delivering chargeable AQA accredited training courses for a variety of environmental issues in the next year to support local projects. So there's quite a lot going on. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much indeed, Catalina. That was very, very thorough. Uh, Miss Austin, um, I saw you busy trying to take all that down with your pen. Um, you can catch up with it uh, on YouTube um, <laughs> when it's released, <laughs> just in case you missed it. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, moving on to agenda item seven, we have questions from members of the council. Two questions have been received from members of the council for this evening. Agenda item 7A, question number one from a member regarding hedgerow cutting. I call upon Councillor Wing. Councillor Wing, are you there? Thank you, Chair. I believe my question is to Councillor Alban. Uh, I, they keep being directed at you. It's just the, top, the topic, I'm afraid, Councillor Alban. My question is, can we ensure that pre-planning is undertaken to ensure none of our hedgerows bushes and trees are cut in any way during the nesting season for birds and other wildlife. That is applying section one of the Wildlife and Countryside Act of 1981. Thank you very much, Councillor Wing. Councillor Alban. Yes, thank you, Chair. It wouldn't be the same without getting a question from Councillor Wing. And uh, I was tempted just to give the short answer of yes, but I wouldn't disrespect her in that in that way. So I will read out. I will read out the full answer. Um, <clears throat> the breeding season for birds is not definitive, and there are exceptions. The RSPB guidance states that nesting season is generally between the first of March and the thirty first of August. During this time, we will not be cutting hedgerows or trees. The only exception to this is when there is, <coughs> excuse me, when there is an urgent public health and safety concern and or the council is served a notice by Kent County Council to carry out urgent works on the highway. The open spaces team has in place a procedures for cutting of trees and hedges with respect to the bird life at all times. Uh, sorry, at all times of the year. For this reason, a process for checking that there are, are no nests present is followed 
using infrared cameras over a period of time to ensure no disturbance takes place. The team also visually check and will avoid areas where nests are present where it is safe to do so, even when carrying out urgent works. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much indeed, Councillor Alden. Councillor Wing, do you have a supplementary? Uh, yes, I'd just like to say I would like to thank the, the teams that actually come out and do the hedge cutting because they do an absolutely fabulous job. And I know there are so many hedges to cut. Uh, there's never been a complaint about the work that the guys actually do. So just thank the team for me. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, thank you. Agenda item 7B, question number two from a member regarding housing. I call upon Councillor Garner. Councillor Garner, are you there? I am. I'm here. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, since agreeing a new local plan for Thanet last year, we've learned that in 2020, Thanet achieved 55% delivery of housing requirement for the area, meaning that um, we haven't met the, or the housing delivery test itself hasn't been met in Thanet. And we're now, there now is a presumption in favour of sustainable development when deciding planning applications. Um, what action is being taken to improve this situation to ensure it is met as soon as possible? And I think that's for the leader. Thank you, Councillor Garner. And your preamble to the question was noted. I call upon the leader to respond. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Garner, for the question. Members will be delighted to know that this answer isn't as long as the last one. Um, Actually, it's a bit of a strange issue, really, because the council can't control the rate of house building except in relation to its own house building program. And that's primarily a matter for the market and what developers decide to do. All the council can do is seek to create the right environment to support new house building, which, of course, is what we do. The council's published housing delivery, deli housing delivery test action plan sets out a wide range of actions and commitments to support house building. The council has already taken most of the actions recommended by MHCLG and is implementing others. The actions include refining our development monitoring processes so that we can better understand delays in development on site, supporting, including financially, the delivery of Thanet Parkway Station and improved travel times from Ashford International Station to improve market perception of the district for both housing and economic development, exploring the establishment of a council-owned housing company and supporting infrastructure-based funding bids to government, um, to the Housing Infrastructure Fund, Local Growth Fund, Main Road Network funding, to improve viability and deliver key infrastructure. This also includes participation in the joint Kent and Medway proposal to the government, known as the Kent Deal, for infrastructure provision in Kent to help support good growth. The action plan was based on significant research into the local housing market and has been commended by the Planning Advisory Service. It's currently being updated. The council employs two housing strategy officers whose role includes supporting local developers and house builders to bring their sites forward. In addition, the cabinet has recently established a cabinet advisory group for housing issues and will be discussing housing supply in detail at its next meeting. And just to conclude, of course, the public often doesn't like to see sites coming forward, even when they've been allocated in the local plan. But as we can see here, if they don't proceed, the effect can be the opposite of what is desired because the government will intervene. And in fact, it makes unplanned development more likely. So it's a bit of a difficult one for the council. Um, it's unfortunate that the, the government has intervened in this way, but it's not entirely something under our control. Thank you very much, Councillor Everett. Councillor Garner, do you have a supplementary question? Um, no, I'd just like to thank, thank the leader for that, um, for that um, full answer to the question. Um, and I look forward to seeing the um, updated action plan um, when it's published. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Garner. Moving therefore on to agenda item eight, having completed our questions, we have a motion on notice this evening. Uh, just the one notice has been received in accordance with council procedure rule number three, agenda item eight, a notice of motion, universal credit uplift payments. I call upon the leader, Councillor Everett. Yes, apologies, members. You're going to get a bit sick of the sound of my voice this evening, but um, there we are. Um, so the motion says Thanet has the highest number of universal credit claimants in Kent, more than 18,000, nearly a quarter of the eligible population and an increase of almost two thirds over the last year due to the impacts of COVID-19 on our local economy. 
A third of these residents are in work, but recorded unemployment is up 80% since March 2020 and now afflicts one in 10 of the working age population. One in eight family households is in fuel poverty. Last March, the Chancellor announced a £20 per week uplift to universal credit and working tax credit for 2021. This has been a vital lifeline to thousands of families in Thanet and provided an eight-figure cash injection to their collective spending power, helping them feed their children, heat their homes and support local business. It has helped contain the severe pressure on the voluntary sector, including local food banks. The estimated cost of the uplift is around 2% of the extra government spending nationally triggered by COVID-19. And even after it is taken into account, UK benefit payments are among the lowest in Europe. No part of Kent will suffer more detriment than Thanet if this uplift is taken away. Nowhere in Kent will more children suffer, more families go cold and hungry, and more local businesses lose out. The lives of residents already struggling to manage will be made harder. This council will speak up for those in urgent need. It calls on both Thanet MPs to do the same. Council urges the Chancellor to retain the £20 uplift in his budget next week and not turn his back on the poorest members of our community. It instructs the leader to write to him tomorrow to express its deep concern about the consequences of removing or reducing this essential support. Uh, and members, our constitution says that motions must be about matters for which the council has a responsibility or which affect the district. And surely nobody looking at these figures could question whether this matter affects our district or how significant this uplift is to the lives of the residents in receipt of it. So it's absolutely right that we should take council time to speak up for those of our residents affected and that we should expect both our local MPs to join us in pressing the Chancellor not to let them down in next week's budget. The impact of poverty on our district is substantial. All tiers of government have their part to play in tackling it. But it is important that this council, the part closest to the community, calls attention to issues that only affect a minority, but do so deeply. I give the government credit for many of its financial interventions during the pandemic, if not for some of the procurement processes that it did or didn't follow. It turns out that the magic money tree was there all along. But clearly, the country's ability to support businesses and individuals on the present scale is time limited and has consequences. The £20 uplift to universal credit is a tiny part of the estimated £300 billion bill for COVID. But the interesting thing about it is that it was deemed necessary at all. We know why the furlough scheme and business grants were introduced. We know that many more people have been pulled into universal credit. But if the scheme was adequate in the first place, then what was the need to increase the amount? The answer, of course, is that universal credit was never adequate. It was intended to make lives difficult. It imposed hard choices on people who are not to blame for the circumstances that oblige them to claim it. What the government realised, I think, is that if a much larger cohort of people were suddenly exposed to the harsh reality, then there would be a political price to pay. Uh, Councillor Everett, I think, is straying quite away from the wording of the motion. I mean, well, I'm entitled to speak to the motion, Chair, I believe. Uh, uh, well, at this point, if you could look for a seconder, perhaps. Well, if you'd allow me to finish explaining why I brought the motion, I think it won't take me very long. Right, OK, then, if you can wind up shortly. So um, let's not lose sight of the fact that a third of our residents on universal credit are in work. As Newington Wall Councillor, I see the fantastic efforts by the team based at the community centre in keeping local people fed, and I'm full of praise for it. And we all know this is replicated in other areas of Thanet, but it's shameful in my view that in this wealthy society, we force people to rely on charity to feed their families, not just in the pandemic, but at all. It's precisely the role of the state to ensure that everyone has this most fundamental level of support. How we do that in the longer term is a subject for another day. This motion is not about the merits or otherwise, of universal credit as a concept, nor am I arguing that the £20 uplift is a panacea. Local food banks are busy regardless of it, but it is clear that taking it away would make the situation worse. This money doesn't sit in bank accounts, it is spent in our economy. If the uplift is taken away, local shops and businesses will lose out too. What's more, as society comes out of lockdown and the economy hopefully recovers, the cost of the uplift will fall because fewer people will be eligible. This motion is deliberately framed so that every member of the council can support it. 
but it is my view that the uplift should be made permanent and that it's just a start to putting in place a proper safety net. Not to, not to provide that has always been a political choice. The question tonight is which one of us wants to take £20 a week from the pockets of our poorest residents. I hope that the answer to that is none. I move the motion and I ask for a seconder. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Councillor Everett, uh, for your motion and for the supporting speech along uh, went along with it. Uh, I presume you've got your seconder to hand? I'll second that, Chair. That's Councillor Alban. That's Councillor Alban. Thank you very much indeed, Councillor Alban. Quite well. Now, members should note that as only council can adopt the motion on notice, the motion will fall if the council does not agree to debate it. Can I have a proposer and a seconder to debate the motion, please? Do I have a proposer? No, I'll propose I'd that. Think... Oh, sorry, Councillor Wing, I'll shut up. I'd like to propose we debate this. It's a very serious matter, I think. I will take a We've got some feedback. Can I have a seconder, please? Councillor Arrow. Right, thank you. If every member can uh, uh, remember to switch off their microphone once they finish speaking, perhaps we can avoid the feedback. Right, okay. Do members agree to debate the motion? I'm not hearing any words to the contrary, and therefore we shall debate, debate the motion. Right, would somebody like to lead, please? Who have I got leading um, here? Councillor Piper, sorry for the interruption. I'm actually looking, lucky me, I'm looking at two pictures of Councillor Ara, and that will probably explain the feedback when she was speaking. I think uh, she's either on two separate machines or has logged in twice, hence the noise. Sorry for the interruption. All right, Councillor Piper, do you think that's the case, Councillor Ara? Have you got two screens open or something? If you have, perhaps it might be an idea to switch one off, saving any feedback. Okay. Right, okay. Who would like to start the motion, uh, discussing the motion this evening? I will, some... uh, I will do it. I will do it, Chair. Councillor Ara, right. Would yeah. you like to take off, Councillor Ara? <laughs> yeah, I wholeheartedly support this motion. Firstly, I would like to thank TDC for their kindness and support towards our residents throughout the pandemic. Also, to our op officers, refu refuse collection teams, and street cleaners for carrying out their services in this difficult time and Paddock Winter Shelter for providing 24-7 accommodation for the most vulnerable people in our society. Tenet is one of the uh, uh, deprived area in the country, as we all know. I have experienced firsthand the increase in numbers that have asked for help from our food bank. I volunteer with the Ramsgate Salvation Army and have heard so many heartbreaking cases. I have personally helped residents with their heating bills. The pandemic has damaged so many of our people financially, physically, and mentally. That will stay with them for a long time, if not forever. I'm deeply concerned about those who suffer in silence, too embarrassed to ask for help or seek donations due to pride. Therefore, I hope that the whole house will support this motion for the benefit of our residents. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ara. Just to advise everybody, I've got a number of people who will be speaking so far. Uh, we will be limiting to three minutes each. So over to you, Councillor Alban. Thank you, Chair. I won't take up three minutes. Uh, it's just something. It's just so, so important, Chair, for 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 our residents. And you know, I'm not going to go into again what what Councillor Everett has said because he's absolutely spot on. Um, but if any of if any of us as councillors can't see the need for the continuation of this u universal credit for our eighteen thousand residents who are who are using it, um, then I, I, I would just be ashamed of this council chair, chairman. I think it's vitally important that we do what we can, as little as it may be, but do what what we can to support our, our residents who need our help. And I really, really hope that uh, the government uh, in and uh, Mr. Sunak in his, in his presentation and budget on next week, I think, um, actually continues this and looks to try and make it a permanent thing. I mean, we, this government can waste 22 billion pound on a track and trace system 
given to its mates that doesn't actually work and yet are looking to take this away from people who who desperately need it so i hope i really hope all members will support this this evening thank you chair thank you councillor album that's well received uh, councillor ashby thank you chair um whilst i wholeheartedly agree that there is a terrible situation with deprivation in the area what we must remember is that we should be fighting for for the residents of Thanet on matters that we can address um i do feel that maybe this developed into a, a little bit of a party political broadcast but i will say that um it is somewhat previous i think we should have um, assessed the situation and the mood at the budget time which is not until the end of march it is believed that um, the Chancellor will extend the universal credit uplift and because the Conservative government understand the financial strain due to the COVID virus has been the strain that has been put on households so it is understood that that is what it will happen so um, there is at this stage not need to write to, to the chancellor you can re-endorse it by that but it is, is there is the understanding that he is going to do this anyway because he does understand the needs of the eighteen thousand people in Thanet, but he also understands the needs of the whole country and this is a national issue and it, that is what we need to be bearing in mind we have local issues that we should be addressing so um you, I think that uh, maybe this is um, a little bit of a wider brief than, than what we're looking at here. We all agree that the £20 uplift is absolutely vital to the people of Thanet and to the people of the whole country that are in need at this time. So in, on that basis, I feel that we will be abstaining from this because we agree and it is already agreed that it will be happening. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much indeed, Councillor Ashby. Councillor Piper, I have you next. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, just echoing really some of the things that Councillor Ashby said um, and also something that uh, Councillor Everett mentioned in, in his words, the number of claimants, of course, will naturally, if that's the right word, forgive me if it isn't, it will fall after the pandemic is over as people's lives begin to return, particularly from employment matters, back to some kind of normal. I would have to say I fully support the decision by the Chancellor, uh, which is being widely reported in all the sensible newspapers and indeed in the Daily Star, that it will be extended until the end of September. So... Uh, there is going to be at least six more months from the end of March when people can be assured that that money will be available. I'm quite sure that the government will take everybody's views into account in terms of keeping that payment, um, but certainly the figures of money involved are not going to be as big as they are now because as our leader mentioned the numbers of claimants will fall in due course but uh, because of the nature of the re request to the mps to write and get these things confirmed i will support the motion this evening thank you mr chairman thank you very much indeed councillor piper councillor curry thank you chair um, yeah, even um, though, though this motion will ultimately be one of, sort of many requests for the Chancellor to renew the £30 uh, uplift to universal credit, I really believe a uh, decision to permanently retain this relatively small increase would make a, a huge difference to all Thanet households who claim this benefit. Around a third of these, um, as uh, others have mentioned, are, are in work. Um, also, I would imagine a large proportion of this increase would be spent within our local community. Um, I fully support this motion and I hope uh, all members agree this is a positive call from the Leader of the Council. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. Councillor Yates, I've got you down next. Thank you, Chair. 
Um, so I'm just going to go through some statistics as I think they're important. But before I do that, I just want to talk about the the duration of the uplift. And uh, I know it is mentioned in the press that this will be a six month extension. Um, however, like the Je the Joseph um, the Joseph Roundtree Foundation actually expects unemployment to peak um, in autumn in autumn of this year. So having a six month duration is just simply not not good enough when unemployment is due to peak in autumn of 2021. Um, so to statistics, we've got over 18,000 claimants of universal credit and working tax credits. Um, we've got some of the highest unemployment in Kent, the highest youth unemployment in the whole of the Southeast. Our houses are some of the worst insulated. Um, this money is expected to, if it, if it continues, would bring in 16 million pounds uh, a year into the Thanet economy to be spent on local businesses and by our residents. Um, so that's £20 a week, but it's £1,000 a year per claimant. So this is this is big money. Um, and on to any potential argument about um, we can't afford it, this isn't, this isn't, this isn't enough. Um, UK benefits um, for unemployment as a percentage of their previous income is one of the lowest in Europe, uh, only 17%. Um, and that's compared with the OECD average of 64% of their previous income through the benefits. So I, I don't see any good reason to justify this. And as a cabinet member for community wealth building, um, I think we should all be keen to see as much money coming into uh, Thanet as possible and into the, our residents' hands, especially during this pandemic. Um, so yeah, I hope we all can support this motion. Thank you very much, Councillor Yates, and for the statistics, which of course always useful. Councillor Wing. Thank you, thank you, Chair. I could actually scream. I'm obviously not going to, but this is long overdue. Uh, uh, my work puts places me out in the community, but and also my role as a councillor, casework, casework particularly around housing and poverty, has been absolutely. Uh, it's ongoing and it's increased. If people need to realise that coastal communities have a particular type of deprivation, and I too am going to uh, go into look at some data and statistics. This is all readily available on KCC's website. There's a lot of stuff there, and I regularly look at this because I'm presently in a role of putting an application in to bring more money into the area. 47% of our wards are in the poorest in Kent. 47% of our wards, of the, of the poorest wards in Kent, exist in Thanet. Low, when we look at lower super output areas, that's a multiple index of deprivation. 35% of those of, 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 of those in Kent exist in Thanet. 10 up 10% 10 of those wall, of those lower lower super output areas are actually in the most deprived. If we look at the southeast region average weekly wage, it is £631. The average for workers in Thanet is £517. If you look Look at the average weekly salary for a female in 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 Thanet, it drops to £350. Child poverty is increased by 2% to 37%. Unemployment is at 10.2%. It's actually a rise of 90%, 90.9% since 2019. And Youth unemployment is at 16%. We as a cabinet, we as a group of people as a council should be shouting and screaming, not only at KCC, because this data is there, it's on their website, much of it is increased or it stays the same and nobody seems to be doing anything. And we need to be shouting at the government that coastal communities like Thanet need extra, extra funding to get our, our communities back on track. We are an area of deep deprivation, deep seated deprivation, and we need to do something about it. So I fully support this motion and thank you for bringing it, Rick. Thank you, Councillor Wing. Councillor Towning. Thank you. Uh, this is a clearly a political statement being made by our leader. Let's remind ourselves that this conservative government has gone beyond any other government in peace times to borrow money, to support people, to support businesses, and keep us alive. And if we're going to carry on paying out large sums of money every single day of the week, we are never going to be able to repay it. And who's going to bear that burden of repayment? That burden of repayment 
is not down to you and I. It's going to be our children, our grandchildren, and go on and on. So we have got to actually be able to cut our clock, like Margaret Thatcher used to say, cut our clock accordingly. So I would never support this motion because it's purely a political matter. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Towning. Uh, Councillor Hopkinson. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just really want to add my voice to uh, supporting this motion. Um, it's really clear from seeing residents in my ward and and, and beyond that across Stanet that there's a, there's a seriously dire need for this. And I just want to refer back to uh, what Councillor Ara said about, you know, because this is something I've also seen firsthand. People do feel shame and they are in desperate situations and they do need us to be speaking for them at the moment. Um, so I really want to add my voice to this. Um, I also would like to just briefly address the point that, OK, it's good to hear that the reports are that uh, the chance there will be will be maintaining this twenty pound uplift, um, but I want to address Councillor Ashby's point that that's a reason to abstain because I really don't see uh, the logic in that. Until it's announced, we don't know that the that the Chancellor is going to do that for sure, and also I don't know how we can be sure that the Chancellor in Westminster understands what people in deprived areas like Ramsgate and Thunet need, unless their representatives like us are speaking up for them. So I really strongly support this motion and I'm really pleased it's being taken uh, to the council. Thank you very much indeed, Councillor Hopkinson. Councillor Jill Bayford. Thank you, Chair. Universal credit is a very complex uh, benefit incorporating six others. I feel that the pandemic has changed everything. People are in need of universal credit who weren't before. Nothing has been suggested to say that this will end until the need is, it, it, it re, is removed. I feel that eventually there will need to be a complete review of the system to meet the situation that people have found themselves in. I therefore find this letter totally unnecessary. Um, yes, six months is what the government are stating at the moment or will be stating as we believe. But I strongly, I'm strongly confident that after that time, if, if the uplift is needed, um, it will be there. I don't think that a, a, a blanket £20 a week is necessarily correct. I think it will need to be addressed according to the situation that people find themselves in after the pandemic. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Councillor Beaver. Councillor Rolfe. Uh, thank you, Chair. I, I apologise, I missed uh, some of other councillors um, uh, speak as uh, I lost the connection and I was waiting to get back in. Um, Sanet has got over 12 food bank groups and distribution centre. And as a volunteer with Sanet Food Link, I, in one of the centre, I evidence every week over 20 families and individuals rely on a food bank. and that 20 pound, imagine how much affects that individual and a family to have a hot meal on their table and not go to bed without a hot meal. As a child grow up in a war zone and go to bed without no hot meal, I feel for them. And as I arrived in this country, the first two, two months, I was put in accommodation with a group of people. We were not allowed to use a hot mill. So I still believe and I still feel for those people how they go to bed knowing their children cannot have a hot mill or they cannot have himself. And they rely in a 21st century in this country on a food bank, on a food distribution. And as a council in here, we need to think about those people. We need to support this motion, not only to keep this 20 pound, to get rid of, of universal credit. I am surprised to see a councillor sitting here to say that we sh the government cannot afford it. We can afford to buy a bomb, but you cannot afford to feed our own people. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rolf. Now I've got the last speaker now, Councillor Whitehead. Thank you, Chair. We're here as a council to represent our residents. That's our main job as a district council. And I've listened to the previous argument that obviously there are tiers of government 
obviously I'm aware that we have central government, we have county and we have district. And in some people's minds, those might be separate. But the fact is that the ways that we need to support residents now during the pandemic are very different. And without central funding directly, it's difficult for us as a district council to do what we need to for what was already a very deprived population. Our demographics in terms of deprivation are terrifying. And over this pandemic, more and more people who've never had to rely on benefits in any form have had to come into the system. And it's a system that's often confusing. It's a system that's often frightening. And I don't believe that this is a political vote or a political choice at this point. Because we know what's right for our residents. And what's right for our residents is that we, as a district council, apply pressure to our representatives to make sure that the voices of our residents are heard at the highest possible level. And I am grateful and I am glad that the people are very, very convinced that this will be extended in a way that will be meaningful for our residents and that will last long enough. But we need guarantees of that for our residents. And that doesn't have to be a political vote. That's a vote based on what is right for our area and for our people and for our community. So please vote to help our residents. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Whitehead. Now, I've had very varying views, quite obviously, about this, and therefore I do need to turn to a vote from the Chamber. Uh, this is not a recorded vote. This is just in order to discern intention of the Chamber. I shall therefore ask the Deputy Monetary Officer, Estelle Culligan, to go through and ask for each person's particular view as we go forward, whether or not this uh, should go to um, uh, agreement with the motion. So, um, Ms Culligan, can I turn to you to go through a list of members uh, to get an idea of intention, please? Thanks very much, Chair. Uh, good evening, members. So I'll just go through everybody's names. Um, Councillor Alban. Yeah, for the motion. Councillor Ara. For. Councillor Ashby. Abstain. Councillor Bailey. For the motion. Councillor Bambridge. Abstain. Councillor Jill Bayford. Abstain. Councillor Robert Bayford. Abstain. Councillor Boyd. Abstain. Abstain. Councillor Coleman Cook. Abstain. Councillor Crittenden. For the motion. Councillor Curry. For the motion. Councillor Dennis. For the motion. Councillor Dexter. Councillor Dexter. Abstain. Okay. Oh. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Duckworth. For the motion. Thank you. Councillor Everett. For the motion. Councillor Farrant. For the motion. Councillor Fellows. Uh, abstain. Thank you. Councillor Game. Abstain. Councillor Garner. For. Councillor Green. For the motion. Thank you. Councillor Gregory. Very much for the motion. Councillor Hart. Abstain. Councillor Hopkinson. For the motion. Thank you. Councillor Huxley. For the motion. Uh, Councillor Keane. For the motion. Councillor Cup. Abstain. 
Thank you. Um, Councillor Patmore. For the motion. <coughs> Councillor Paul Moore. Abstain. Councillor Ovenden. For the motion. Councillor Parsons. Abstain. Um, Councillor Stuart Piper. For the motion. Councillor Potts. Councillor Potts. Okay. Uh, Councillor Pugh. Abstain. Councillor Rattigan. Abstain. Councillor Rolf. Four. Councillor Rogers. Abstain. Councillor Roper. For the motion. Thank you. Councillor Rizeki. For the motion. Councillor David Saunders. Abstain. Thank you. Councillor Maeve Saunders. Abstain. Councillor Savage. Abstain. Councillor Scobie. For the motion. Councillor Scott. Abstain. Councillor Shrub. Abstain. Councillor Tomlinson. Abstain. Councillor Towning. Abstain. Um, Councillor Whitehead. For the motion. Councillor Wing. For the motion with bells on. Councillor Wright. Abstain. Thank you. Councillor Yates. For. So I believe, Chairman, that's 25 for and 24 abstentions. 25 for and 24 abstentions. Well, therefore, the motion is carried. And I presume the letter will be put together to send to the Chancellor for um, his consideration. So thank you very much indeed, members. We shall now move on to agenda item nine, the leader's report. Now, as this meeting is entirely virtual, the leader's report has been circulated to all members and published on the council website. I therefore call upon the leader uh, to make a report this evening, leader. Councillor Everett. Uh, I think, Chair, that um, it's for uh, Councillor Ashby to comment on my report since my report has been published. Yes, and you're quite right, but I did wonder if you were going to say a few things. Councillor Ashby, therefore, can I turn to you? Thank you, Chair. Um, and I apologise. I'm having some um, Wi-Fi issues this evening, so um, if I lose my video link, then um, I'll, I'll try and keep the um, audio running. So thank you, Chair. I would like to pay condolences and express my sadness on the great loss of Councillor... Peter Campbell. For me personally, as a new councillor, I learned a great deal from Peter, even though I will admit at first I found him a bit scary. My first committee sitting with Peter was at Overview and Scrutiny in August 2015. I learned from him that we as councillors have a duty to read and understand our papers and not be afraid to ask questions. One of my favourite memories of Peter will always be that every year at full council agenda item for members allowances he would mischievously raise a point of order and ask if we the members should declare an interest and every year the monitoring officer would reply that we were exempt maybe someone in the labor group would like to keep that traditional going thank you for that point our group also sends Gary Taylor our best wishes for his retirement and thank him for his contribution to the district during his time as a councillor. I join the leader in welcoming the major reduction in the co local COVID virus infection rate. Hopefully we are seeing the light at the end of the tunnel, but we must not be led into a full sense of security and now this heinous virus to revisit us. 
Although it has been a very, very long 12 months, caution for a, long while, for a little while longer will reward us and, and leave the term lockdown as a distant memory. We express our thanks and what should be our never ending gratitude to the National Health Service and care staff, but also remember everyone on the front line, which includes the TDC staff, that for nigh on a year have kept the services running through these very difficult times. I would also like to thank the finance team for the excellent work in getting grant funds to over 1,500 businesses in the district. The Manston situation remains a concern and it is disappointing that we are not able to halt the backsliding from what was supposed to be a contingency site into a full-blown component to the country's goods and import and export strategy. I support, suppose it's, un, it's unfortunate that the unnecessary and avo avoidable delays to the reopening and development of the airport meant it was there for the taking. The sale of Dreamland and removal of the high risk to our, of our sorry, and removal of the high risk to our financial position, especially in the current economic climate, is not only the best solution for the council, but also for the future of the park, giving it every chance to survive and prosper once we emerge from the pandemic. Perhaps the leader could confirm that the delay on the sale caused by the Labour Council's demand for additional valuations didn't have a negative impact on the sale value of £7 million. The idea of replicating the project model used for the Margate Town deal for maximising the benefit to Ramsgate following the provisional award of 2.7 million through the future high street fund will be effective if all local groups are engaged with it is essential that ideas and research that has already been undertaken are collated and utilized in the project bringing the port study into the framework makes perfect sense to enable joined up thinking and underpins the whole process of both the port and harbour alongside the high street retail and leisure facilities for economic regeneration I can't agree with your statement that the old model of evening public meetings in the community is of limited use. The principles of full democratic process are based on access for all. If we can learn anything from the Hanford Parish Council Zoom debacle, simply transferring traditional meetings onto online video platforms is certainly not enough to encourage democratic dialogue or to avoid providing tools that favour the loudest or aggressive person thus making it easier to create opposition than consensus. Do we really want to end up as stay-at-home keyboarders? I am concerned that a major shift in thinking to all things online being the way forward at council committee meetings or public engagement is steering us away from being more engaged from the res with the residents of Thanet. This is highlighted by the Cabinet's proposal to charge an administration fee to residents who wish to submit comments to TDC on planning matters either by email or writing which are deemed long or complex responses rather than using the online consultation portal to which our group are strongly opposed and I request it is removed from the SCI. However I can agree there is a practical sense using video software for certain elements like training and members briefings but I certainly believe that for our main activities live physical engagement should never be lost at council or indeed government. It doesn't have to be either or a hybrid solution is the future therefore i request the leader to seriously consider for us to return to the chamber at the next full council meeting with a mixed solution of maybe the chair the cabinet and shadow along with main committee chairs and a percentage of members with the balance of members joining from home via video link at the old time of 7 p.m thank you Thank you very much indeed, Councillor Ashby. And in fact, I could endorse that. For my part, I would very much welcome the opportunity to return for, for full council to the chamber. Um, and it's something I have been discussing with um, the head of democratic services, uh, the possibility of a hybrid meeting. Uh, Councillor um, Everett, would you like to respond to Councillor Ashby? Thank you. Yes, I would. And I think um, I'll just deal with the Dreamland point, first of all. I mean, I think everybody who's been involved with Dreamland and, and, and the recent sale of it would know that it is an exceptionally complicated matter. Um, I'm, I'm grateful, and I think it was probably Councillor Campbell, actually, who wanted two valuations. I can't quite remember, but certainly he was part of, um, he, was, he was interested in that subject. Um, and I don't, the fact that we sought two valuations certainly had no influence on the timescale at all. Um, 
that it's just a very complicated process. Um, but thankfully, we've reached the end of it. Um, I think the whole this whole subject of um, online interaction is a very interesting one. Um, as far as the council meetings are concerned, I don't think that's a matter for me as leader. Um, I think that's a matter for the chair of council and for um, for the whole council to consider. Um, obviously, as soon as it's safe to be back in the council chamber, I, I would welcome that. And um, I think we also have to look at what the law says. Um, the law doesn't allow us at the moment to have meetings after, I think, about May the 7th, which are held virtually at all. Um, no, nobody could then participate. I think the law is likely to be changed in the next uh, the next uh, few weeks and months. Um, uh, I'm, I'm in favour of getting back to the council chamber, but I'm also in favour of making the best use of technology. And I think that what we're talking about in terms of public engagement is building on the success that we've seen in engaging with members online. Um, more people come to our online briefings than ever came to the briefings in the council chamber. I'm sure that's also true in the community. Doesn't mean that we wouldn't have public meetings. It just means that we have to recognise a lot of people don't feel safe going out in the evening, don't want to go out in the evening, um, and don't come to those meetings anymore, except on particular topics. And I accept that there are exceptions. But I think the, the answer is a mixture. I absolutely agree. And I'm not suggesting anything otherwise. I'm a bit puzzled by this sudden focus from Councillor Ashby on the um, the administration fee in the um, statement of community involvement, because when it came to count, when it came to cabinet, nobody from the Conservative group had anything to say whatsoever. And it was only after when it appeared on a blog site somewhere that the Conservative group started taking an interest in it. So I don't know whether they hadn't had the chance to read the report before the meeting or what. Um, obviously, it's a consultation. Um, and we will we will take notice of the response we get in the consultation. No decision has been taken, um, but it's a very minor matter which would affect very few people, um, and we'd have to look at what the uh, dimensions of that. But I can assure you that there's no attempt going on here to make it more difficult for people to contribute their opinions. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Councillor Everett. Um, just to clarify, um, against what I said earlier, I would not ever endorse going against the law, merely my enthusiasm as chair to reconvene uh, in the chamber at uh, TDC as and as when legally possible. So thank you very much. Moving on to the Councillor Reverend Piper. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Uh, Leader, thank you for your report. Uh, much of it, as always, is factual and very informative and gives us some insight into the, the hard work that not only you, but also and especially the members of staff and the officers of the council. So I just really want to say that I think staff and officers deserve our continuing full support as members. And we all know that most areas that we need to be addressed are addressed and usually more directly without actually coming through the the formalities of a full council meeting unless it's absolutely necessary um, and I think it's good for the public to know that the members have real support and encouragement for uh, off senior officers and all their staff. Uh, Thanet COVID numbers are thankfully very low now around about 70 as opposed to about 570 per 100,000 just a few uh, months ago just a couple of months ago um, I, I think we need to continue to encourage uh, Thanet people whom we represent that whatever its failings might be, broadly speaking, the lockdown and the vaccination programme and testing programmes have worked. And personally, I don't uh, make any distinction between which political group is in power. I think the current government have worked exceptionally hard and we have we are evidence of the fact that it is working it has failings but it is working tdc communication with the public i think has improved immensely over the last 12 months with regular bulletins and things being published on social media platforms and uh that has resulted i think and i hope it will continue to result in a lot more uh interaction with members so i would say uh, long may that continue. I didn't mention uh, separately a matter of the late Peter Campbell because I knew it was there was a comment about his service uh, in your report and of course we uh, as a group but certainly myself as an individual having the opportunity uh, to respond to your report 
uh, would want to endorse everything that's been said about Peter as a man. Mr Chairman, I hope in responding to uh, the leader's report and his comments about uh, uh, Peter Campbell, you won't mind if I uh, pick up on his comment that he joined the council from 2007. So he's been a councillor from 2007. Then we have a little dash to 2021. And there is a small, very short piece of work written by Linda Ellis in 1996, and it's simply called The Dash. I would like, with your indulgence, to share it. It's just a few lines. I read of a man who stood to speak at the funeral of a friend. He referred to the dates on the tombstone from the beginning to the end. He said what mattered most of all was the dash between the years. For Peter, the dash today is a period of service. It's a length of time. But Linda Ellis goes on to write about, it matters not as people how much we own, the cars, the house, the cash, what matters for us as councillors, and I believe we can all learn something from the late Peter Campbell, what matters to us as councillors is how we live and serve during that dash. Thank you, Mr Chen. Thank you very much indeed for that, uh, Councillor Piper, and I would endorse that myself. I've always been firmly of the opinion that to be a councillor is an act of service. Leader, over to you. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Councillor Piper, and, and as we might expect, obviously you speak very well in these circumstances, because I think you have some experience of, uh, of reflecting on, on the end of people's lives. One thing we haven't said about Councillor Campbell is how brave he was in the face of his impending death. Um, and I certainly, you know, it certainly uh, made, a, made a great impression on me. Um, I, I welcome your comments about the staff, Councillor Piper. Um, I think our senior officers and our, our, all our officers, in fact, are performing admirably in difficult circumstances. Um, we've got used to this remote working, but it's, um, it's still strange. Um, I look forward to being able to meet more of them face to face, as I'm sure members do across the council. Um, and I, I don't denigrate their service when I talk about the magnificent service of the staff in the NHS. Um, I think we all know the NHS are a bit special, but our staff have, have done very well. And yeah, I would agree about the vaccination programme. Um, I'm just waiting for my appointment. Thank you very much indeed, Leader. Uh, Councillor Garner, are you ready to comment on uh, the Leader's report? I am, Chair. Thank you very much. Um, and like the others, I'd also like to start by joining the leader and everyone else in expressing my sadness at the death last week of um, Peter Campbell. Being a relative newcomer, I didn't have the opportunity to get to know him well, but I certainly appreciated the knowledge and experience he brought to committee meetings I sat on with him, and as mentioned, his willingness to challenge and ask questions. It's certainly something we can all look to do more of. It's also sad that Councillor Gary Taylor has decided to stand down, another whose contributions will be missed. But I'm sure he'll remain as active within the wider community as he was as a councillor. As we start taking the first steps towards reopening society, I'd also once again like to join the leader in thanking all frontline workers across Thanet for their hard work keeping us all safe, and to especially thank all council employees who continue to maintain essential services during these difficult times, including the recent spell of bad weather. The leader has highlighted how the mismanagement of the easing of last year's lockdown caused a number of issues with the sudden influx of visitors to the aisle. We recognise that a number of officers have been working hard to prepare for the coming summer and have welcomed the engagement at a recent member briefing to discuss the new public safety protection order, of which we are generally supportive. Of course, the success of this PSPO will not just be dependent on how well it is communicated, but also on how effectively it is enforced. One of our particular concerns is the adverse impact that the growing number of jet skis has had on the coastline and its wildlife, particularly in waters adjacent to major seabird 
breeding colonies, which also affects our common and grey seal populations. We would urge that more, that more thought is given to making sure provision is made for their protection. As the leader mentions, Manston has remained in the news for one reason or another. It does indeed seem as if, like many other government plans, there is no clear path to the ending of the temporary use of Manston as either a COVID testing facility or as a lorry holding area. The impact on the surrounding villages may indeed have been less than expected, and we hope it stays that way. As for part 73 of the DCO saga, we of course welcome the fact that the Secretary of State has had to go back to the drawing board on this. Not only was his analysis of the need for the development flawed, his decision inadequately reasoned and procedural safeguards prescribed in the infrastructure planning rules breached, he failed to discharge his duty to meet carbon emissions targets under Section 1 of the Climate Change Act 2008. It's time for the Secretary of State and others to finally accept that the inspectors in their wisdom and after a full examination of the evidence were right and there is no case for reopening the airport. We also have to say that we have been shocked to hear recent comments from one of our MPs and others sharing environmental concerns about excessive development on their patches. Uh, Councillor Garner, can we stick to uh, the leader's report, please? I'm just covering the Manston issue that he, um, that he brought up. Um, just that their champion of the airport in the first place made these developments a fait accompli. We welcome the provisional award of 2.7 million through the future High Street Fund and share the disappointment that the government has only awarded 69% of the original bid. We know that there are difficult decisions to make and hope that the local groups and residents who worked hard to prepare the bid in the first place with are fully engaged throughout the process. As I'm sure the leader is aware, local Ramsgate residents are also concerned that the port consultation seems to be being rolled it up into the wider Ramsgate consultation which some think may end up with it being downplayed or shelved or information not being available to residents about what's happening with it, with them um, Brits. There's massive potential at the port, but at present it's losing money on a daily basis. So we urgently need a plan for it, particularly with the council's finances as tight as they are. To finish off, we welcome the leader's commitment to enable better communication with the wider community of than it. As he knows, we as a group favour a more open and transparent way of working so that the residents who elect us are able to see and understand how and why decisions are made. We recognise that there is indeed a lot of misinformation out there and believe that the best way to tackle this is to make sure we as a council not only share as much factual information as possible but also engage with the wider community in regular public forums including old style face-to-face -face meetings once they're allowed again. There's huge enthusiasm and talent in Thanet and very many groups concerned with improving things in our communities who we need to be listening to. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Garner. Councillor Everett, back to you. Yeah, thank you, Councillor Garner. And um, just on this, on this issue of, of public engagement, I, I think that um, we, we all know that there are certainly motive topics. The airport is one, um, probably the Port and Harbour is another one, which is quite possible to have a large public meeting. But I think there's a lot more that we can share with our residents. For example, about the PSPOs, perhaps, that we can do online and that we, they are more likely to participate and they're more likely to watch the meeting on, on YouTube or they're more likely to join the meeting and ask questions online than they are actually to go to a public meeting. Um, to go out of their ways, out of their homes, spend time in their evening, traveling, traveling backwards and forwards. So this, and this is just about improving accessibility. It's not about a, a replacement strategy. So yes, more engagement, use both routes, but certainly we need to do some experimenting and we need to present to the public who we actually are rather than the caricatures that we're sometimes presented as. Um, and sometimes we present each other as, let's, let's be honest, for political purposes. Um, in terms of uh, jet skis, I mean, this was extensively discussed at the members' briefing, and I thought that there was a, a good range of opinion there, including um, some councillors who spoke up on behalf of uh, water users, uh, and that was interesting as well. Um, I'm not personally a fan of jet skis. I've made that pretty clear uh, in the past, 
Um, but the, the 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 effect of the PSPOs and the intention of the PSPOs is to better manage jet skis. We're actually taking out some sites that they can currently be reduced, currently be launched from. Um, and I, I absolutely agree about enforcement, but enforcement isn't just about a big stick approach. It's also about um, educating people and it's also about bringing people along with you. So there's a lot of work to be done in that area. And we will be talking about the PSPOs again at Cabinet, I think on March the 18th. And I hope that members will come along and have their say there because we would welcome their input as indeed we did those who were at the briefing. Um, and I think that's it, thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Leader. That covers the Leader Report and Agenda Item 9. Um, moving on to Agenda Item 10, the report of the Chairman of the Overview and Scrutiny Panel. <laughs> I call upon Councillor Bayford to present the report. Thank you, Chairman. Um, it's impossible to use the word scrutiny on TDC without mentioning Peter Campbell, and I make absolutely no apologies for doing so. Um, I hope I won't repeat what's been said, and I won't say very much, but I do think it's important to note that Peter was on scrutiny from 2007 right the way through till his death. And for the last six years was chair or vice chair of that committee. Points have already been made that he'd always read his papers thoroughly. He was very well informed whenever he turned up at a meeting. He was a tough inquisitor, but always very fair. No disrespect to Councillor Curry, but I'm afraid that I feel that as far as scrutiny is concerned, Peter Campbell is irreplaceable. He was the embodiment of the cliche of someone who takes their task seriously, but never takes themselves too seriously. I've been on this council an awful lot of years, and I've seen a lot of good councillors, but Peter was simply one of the best. And I've got to say that as far as I'm concerned, it was an absolute privilege to work with him. Oh, and I nearly forgot, I asked members to note the report. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Councillor Bayford. Now, he's come all the way from Kingsgate for this. Do members have any comment on his report at all? I'm not here. Oh, I've got one hand up from Councillor Ashby. You've got a hand up, Councillor Ashby. Do you wish to say something? Uh, sorry, Chair. I think that was a, from a previous uh, agenda item. Although I really relish speaking to Councillor Bayford, on this particular occasion, I, I don't have anything to, to add. Sorry. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Mutual appreciation here. Right. Thank you very much indeed, Councillor Bayford. Moving on to agenda item 11, Council Tax Resolution 2021 to 2022. Uh, members will have received a supplementary agenda today. It's only quite minor. I would advise that in accordance with Council Procedure Rule 70.6, I will call for a recorded vote on the motion or any amendment substantive motions that may arrive. I will now ask the Cabinet Member for Finance, Administration, Community, Wealth Building, Councillor Yates, to present the report. Councillor Yates, would you like to present your report, please? Yes, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, so, as you say, as a result of some last-minute adjustments to facilitate council tax billing, there have been a number of rounding changes made to the originally published report. These have been highlighted in yellow within the report, but for reference, these are on Table 4, the Kent Police and Crime Commissioner, uh, band F has been increased one pence from £315 and 10 pence to £315 and 11 pence. And on table five, band F, each parish figure is increased by two pence. Um, this is a statutory report presented in a prescribed format. Now that preceptors have set their precepts, council can resolve council tax for Thanet residents from 2021 to 2022. The preceptors are Kent County Council, Kent Fire and Rescue, the Kent Police and Crime Commissioner and the Parish and Town Councils. The focus of this report is the request for members to approve Thanet's element of the council tax for 2021 to 2022. However, in reality, there's no room for variation from the proposed presented in the report. The real business and hard work of the budget setting process was conducted at council two weeks ago when members agreed our budget. The budget is predicated on the council tax increase that is presented in the report and due to the constraints that this government continues to place upon locally elected members, we cannot consider any further increase without subjecting a proposal to a local referendum. In terms of our increase for next year, I draw members' attention to Table 6 at the end of the report. As stated above, the £4.99 increase is the maximum permitted, but even with this restriction, 
This shows that our 2.1% increase is once again one of the lowest increases of all public bodies, as district councils have not been afforded the same flexibility to consider tax increases as the 5% increase for counties or the £15 for the police. Following KCC's recent announcement to allocate funding for a £50 hardship payment for residents eligible for the council tax support, TDC officers and civic care colleagues have worked hard to ensure that these measures are in place. And I'm pleased to confirm tonight that residents um, will benefit from this £50 discount immediately rather than having to wait for it to be applied retrospectively. On top of having one of the most generous council tax support schemes in the county, this additional discount will help protect the most vulnerable even further in these uncertain times. I move the recommendations. Thank you, Councillor Yates. Uh, do you have a second ready? A seconder, please. I'll second that, Chair, Councillor Alban. Councillor Alban is seconding. Thank you very much indeed. Do I have anybody who wishes to speak? Well, we will now begin a recorded vote. Just a reminder of the recommendations that members approve the Furniture District Council element of the council tax charges set out in the report, that members approve the determination at section one of this report. Can I move therefore to uh, the Deputy Monitoring Officer, Mr Culligan, to carry out um, the recorded vote. Ms Culligan. Thanks very much, Chair. So, councillors, I'll go through everybody's name again, and if you just say um, with it in favour, against or abstain. Thank you. So, um, Councillor Alban. Four. Councillor Ara. Four. Councillor Ashby. Four. Councillor Bailey. Four. Councillor Bambridge. Four. Councillor Jill Bayford. Four. Councillor Robert Bayford. Four. Councillor Boyd. Four. Four. Councillor Colin Cox. Sorry, is that a four? Yep. Four for me. Yeah, four. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Sorry, there was a bit of an echo. Councillor Crittenden. In favour. Councillor Curry. Four. Councillor Dennis. Four. Councillor Dexter. Four. Councillor Duckworth. Four. Councillor Everett. Four. Councillor Farrance. Four. Councillor Fellows. Four. Councillor Game. Four. Councillor Garner. Four. Councillor Green. Four. Thank you. Councillor Gregory. Four. Councillor Hart. Four. Councillor Hopkinson. Four. Thank you. Councillor Huxley. Four. Councillor Keane. Four. Councillor Cup. Four. Thank you. Councillor Patmore. Four. Councillor Paul Moore. Four. Councillor Ovenden. Four. Councillor Parsons. Four. Councillor Stuart Piper. Four. Councillor Potts. I don't think Councillor Potts is here. Councillor Pugh. Four. Thank you. Councillor Rattigan. Four. Councillor Rolfe. Four. Councillor Rogers. Four. Councillor Roper. Four. Councillor Rizeki. Four. Councillor David Saunders. Four. Councillor Maeve Saunders. Four. Councillor Savage. 
Four. Councillor Scobie. Four. Councillor Scott. Four. Councillor Shrub. Four. Councillor Tomlinson. Four. Councillor Towning. Four. Councillor Whitehead. Four. Councillor Lee. Councillor Wing. Sorry, sorry. A moment of not being here. Four. <laughs> Councillor Potts. Yeah. Oh, um, it was four. Four, right. Okay, thank you, Councillor Potts. Um, Councillor Wright. Four. And Councillor Yates. Four. Thank you, um, Chair. That's unanimous, and it's fifty-four. Thank you very much indeed, Miss Culligan. Thank you very much, everybody. Agenda item 12, our last agenda item this evening, changes to representatives on outside bodies. Now, the recommendations are to agree the following two changes for the remainder of the 2020-21 year. Number one, that Councillor Boyd replaces Councillor Cup on the Young People's Partnership Conversation. Number two, that Councillor Ovenden replaces Councillor Huxley on the Sandwich and Peckle Bay National Nature Reserve Steering Group. I move that the recommendation should be detailed below be agreed with the Vice Chairman, please second. Second that, Mr Chairman. Now, unless anyone objects the recommendation, I take them as agreed. Is everybody in agreement? And I don't see any difficulty here at all, so that therefore is agreed. Thank you. Members, thank you very much indeed for your attendance this evening. That concludes the business of the meeting of the Council. Thank you very much indeed.